columnist at The Sun, Trevor Kavanagh. Morning, Trevor. Good morning, Kevin. Uh, well, you heard Nick Gibb, the schools minister there, I think uh, sort of rather studiously playing this down. Uh, but your paper is saying that as many as 150 schools uh, may uh, be forced in some way to close, uh, possibly not all of the school, but uh, some schools fully, others. Now, I estimated that arguably this could involve like 100,000 kids. Why is this happening just before term when five years ago, we're told, the government was all warned all about this? Uh, and the Telegraph today says this sounds like lockdown all over again. Once again, uh, kids can't get to the classroom. Well, I, I think that this is suddenly uh, like stepping on a rake. It's hit the government between the eyes. And uh, uh, I think you have to always think, where are the people in charge of these schools? And where have they been for all the last five years? I, I'm, it's the same with the health service. Suddenly the government lands with a hot issue in its lap. And in the end, you find out that half the problem lies with the authorities who have not acted on evidence that they could have uh, dealt with sooner. I think, frankly, that um, Mick Gibb is one of the uh, figures of calm, cool uh, continu continuity in the government, and uh, he's been there throughout those, what is it, six or seven other education secretaries. And I thought his explanation of it for this was quite compelling, and I think he's an honest politician, which is rare. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, he certainly gave straight answers, and uh, I hope he's right uh, that perhaps, uh, you know, it won't be 100,000 kids uh, and uh, a few porter cabins might sort the situation and not too many children will have to stay at home. But the fact is, it's quite clear, as he did actually concede, some kids will have to stay at home and that will not be a good look for the government, will it? No, and I mean, look, the kids have had a terrible time for the last exactly. three or four years with COVID and uh, the absences from the classroom, which, again... Uh, Half the, the government had a role to play, but it was the unions and the teachers who refused, simply refused to go into a classroom with children who are most unlikely to have any serious effects from COVID. I think that was quite scandalous on the part of the teaching profession. Uh, the government, of course, has a role, but it cannot command all of these people to do things they refuse to do. Uh, but nonetheless, the casualties here are children whose education, not for the first time in recent years, are having their education disrupted, and they will pay a price for that. Um, tr thank you for that, Trevor. Let's uh, just quickly move on, because we originally were going to get you on to in an item that we were calling Rishi's Yes Men, uh, insofar as, uh, you know, Grant Shapps has got his 56th Cabinet Post of the Year <laughs> or something like that. I think he literally has had five senior Cabinet Posts this year. There's something really absurd about that. It really does point to a government in some kind of a disarray. Uh, why did he get the defence job? Uh, is it because he's a yes man? Well, two reasons. One, absolutely and um, total loyalty to uh, Rishi Sunak over the years. Um, I think that that is probably the key factor. I think he's also fairly good in terms of radio and television. When the government's in trouble, they push uh, Grant Shapps onto the uh, microphones and in front of the cameras to defend the indefensible. So these are assets as far as this government in the last uh, days of, before the election. <clears throat> but I, I've never been a great supporter or fan of Grant Shapps since he was the one who piled the tens of millions, hundreds of millions into these low traffic neighbourhood schemes, Agreed. which have blocked down local roads. And, uh, uh, so, and also on the issue of heat pumps. Um, I think that there's an element of lightweight about the... Um, the career of uh, Grant Shapps, which explains the fact that he's had so many jobs in such a short period. Yeah, I mean, that's what I think he lacks. I mean, he, he, I, there's too much has been made of a lack of military experience. Uh, mo I spoke to Colonel uh, Richard Kemp, uh, who said that in his experience, the best um, secretaries of state for defence that he dealt with didn't have any medical experience, uh, sorry, military experience. They don't need that. I think that's slightly unfair. But what I would say about... Uh, the office, the great office of state of Secretary of State for Defence is it requires a person of gravitas and I don't think Grant Shapps is a person of gravitas. He doesn't demonstrate it visibly, does he? <laughs> um, the point about uh, Ben uh, Wallace was that he 
could see trouble coming, he could see it coming halfway and acted upon it before it became serious trouble. I mean, he was the first person seriously to forecast that the Russians would invade uh, the uh, Ukraine. <clears throat> and I, I was sitting next to him at the time he told me this back in December uh, 2022. Uh, 21, and uh, he, uh, I wish I'd taken more notice of him because he saw it way before anybody else. Yeah. And I think the other thing that he has to his credit is the fight for money for the armed forces. And will Grant Schrapps stand up to the Chancellor and the Prime Minister and say, we must have the cash to pay our troops and give them the equipment they need to fight? Uh, and the answer to that question is no, he won't. He will do what, he what he's told, as he always does. Uh, Trevor, fantastic to talk to you as always. Thank you very much for your time.